Hello, my name is Eric Upton. I'm with Bridgeway Christian Church. And a little bit ago, Olivia Sperlin asked me if I could answer some questions for a class that she had um, that wanted to know uh, insider information about uh, young married couples. And totally committed to it, said, yeah, I can do that, and then totally dropped the ball. So that one's on me. And I'm sure you hear a lot from students, oh, I planned it and I sent them the stuff and they never got back to me. And that's why I was late. Well, um, understand that this is actually one of those times where that's very true. Uh, she was totally on the ball and I was not. So um, I'm recording this video to kind of answer the questions and I believe she's turning in a paper as well. Um, but hopefully this can go along with it and uh, be help to her and, and maybe to you in, in your classroom too. So um, I work at Bridgeway Christian Church. I'm the middle school pastor over there. Um, I've been married for almost five years now. My wife and I got married um, August 15th of 2009. And so our five-year anniversary is coming up uh, pretty shortly. Um, so let's see, four... Uh, Four and a half, five years ago, I was uh, 24, about to be 25. Um, so I, I actually got married to my wife, uh, Christina, about 10 days before uh, my 25th birthday. Um, so that's how old I was when I got married. Um, like I said, been married for almost five years now. Our anniversary is coming up uh, this August, and we're super excited about it. Um, so third question is, how did I know that uh, she was the one? Um, which is kind of a funny question for me just because of where I stand on that whole idea. Um, Christy and I, we've spoken a number of times. We did this when we were dating, but uh, to be honest with you, I don't know if I fully buy into the whole one idea. Um, I, I believe that God gives us the freedom to make the decisions that we make to be in the relationships that we are. He gives us that freedom. He gives us the opportunities and he gives us the intelligence and the wisdom and discernment and also tries to surround us with quality people that can help guide us through our relationships. Um, cause I don't think relationships are meant to be just between the two people. I think they're meant to be one of those things where it's a community thing that, that builds and pours into each other. So, um, to answer that question, um, when Christy and I were dating, it wasn't that all of a sudden I woke up one morning and I was like, Oh my goodness, she's the one I'm supposed to be with. Um, for me, it was as we were dating, as we were going through the relationship, I discovered things about her, um, that I found were pieces that I wanted, pieces that I um, needed in a partner that I was going to carry through life. Um, doing ministry, uh, it requires some interesting things of the people that you align yourself with, especially if you're going to be married to someone and doing ministry vocationally or full time. Um, you need someone to understand what that means. It's not just a sacrifice for the person who is doing the ministry um, and getting paid for it. It's a sacrifice for the entire family and it requires a lot from them. Um, and so watching her attitude as we dated while I was doing ministry, um, watching her heart going on mission trips with her, watching her um, pour into the lives of students and girls and moms and other women and those types of things, um, coming to her with my issues and my struggles and, and problems and sharing those things with her and getting responses from her um, that were unique, that were impacting, that were a different perspective than what I can come up with on my own because of our personality differences. Um, that's what meant a lot to me and, and started to get my mind thinking, wow, this is someone that I want to spend the rest of my life with, that I want to be connected with and joined with and, um, partnered with, uh, when I think about, you know, being with the one, um, to me, it, it comes down to a conversation of, okay, marriage is work. It is a ton of work. And it's everyday work and you don't get a day off when it comes to marriage and it's not easy. There's a ton of fun to it. There's a lot of laughter and a lot of joy, but there's a lot of just difficult stuff that goes along with it as well. And so for me, it's a conversation of, okay, if I'm going to align myself with someone and I'm going to work towards a committed marriage that's going to last the rest of my life, um, who do I want to partner with? How much work and effort do I want to have to put towards that? Do I want to make things easier on myself or more difficult on myself? Where do I want to challenge myself? In what areas of my life do I want to be challenged by that other person? The Bible says as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another in Proverbs. And I think that as much as that can apply to friendship and as much as that can apply to community with inside the church, 
it also applies to marriage too. How do I want to be sharpened by the person that I partner myself with throughout the rest of my life? Um, Christy's a very different personality than me. Um, I'm a visionary, a dreamer, a, a thinker. I just say stuff that comes to the top of my head as if it's a well thought out plan. Uh, Christy's more analytical. She uh, hears something and says, okay, if this is the goal, here's all the little steps that it takes to get to here. So here's where you are. Here's where you want to be. Here's the steps that it takes in between and why that might be a difficult thing. And in sharing those types of things, it's helpful for me to walk through that process with her. I loved that about her, that she challenged me, that she stretched me. So um, I don't know if that's a really great answer to how did I know that she was the one. Um, I didn't know that she was the one like, oh, you're the one that God planned for me. Um, she was the one that through the course of our relationship and through the course of discovering more about her, she's the one I wanted to be with. She's the one that I wanted to spend my life with. Um, so that's how I would answer that question. Um, number four is what are some of the biggest adjustments you made from being single to being married? Uh, a lot. Um, I think time's a big one, how I spent my time, um, as a single guy, um, man, it was awesome. Cause you go, you go on a date, you go hang out, you spend the day together, but then at the end you drive home you go to your own place and you shut the door and I turn on the TV and I watch NFL network and I veg out. I go into the freezer and I get a frozen pizza out. I pop it in the oven with some tater tots and I sit on the couch alone in quiet watching TV, doing nothing or playing uh, PlayStation three or, or whatever it is. And um, man, when you're married, those, those things shift and they change and um, how you spend your time and how you spend your free time uh, are very different things. Um, how you care uh, for the other person changes drastically. Um, one thing we learned in premarital counseling was each person comes in with their own expectations into the marriage. Um, and those expectations are often built just on family traditions and dynamics that you always grew up with. Um, you know, for instance, in my family, when it came to dinner time, uh, we had Sunday and that was family dinner time. The other six days of the week, it was, you know, eat when you're here, eat what you want to eat and make it yourself. And it was, you know, like a bunch of ships just kind of passing in the night. And that's how I grew up. And I was fine with that. And I was comfortable with that. Well, I went into marriage with the assumption that that's just the way it was going to be. And um, Christy, however, was very different. Her family, um, because she's the oldest and it went all the way down to her youngest brother, Blake, who was um, 10 at the time that we got married. Um, they had set family dinner times. They um, got together around the dinner table and they shared about each other's day and mom made the meal and dad helped. And then everybody got up from the table and helped clean up. And that was their tradition. And the funny part is I had been involved in their family. I had been a part of that process. I just never realized that that's something she would bring into our marriage. And so you have a lot of these little tensions and that's just one example, but there's a lot of those that both people bring into marriage as expectations that the other person just knows are there, that they're just going to fall into line and what you experienced in your family growing up will be what's replicated inside your marriage. The problem is when two separate people bring two separate experiences, that often creates a lot of little clashes and arguments and disagreements and misunderstandings and miscommunications and all that stuff. And a lot of times you start fighting about the issue, like why don't we have dinner together and, and why don't you want to sit down with me and that kind of stuff. When in reality the issue is, hey, I have this expectation and you're not meeting it. And hey, my expectation was different. That's why I'm not meeting it. And you're also not meeting my expectation. So going into our marriage, those were a lot of conversations that we had to have. Um, how does laundry get done? Who does the dishes? Who does the cleaning of the house? Um, who takes care of the bills and the budget? Um, who goes out and, and works the majority of the time? Do both of us go out and work the majority of the time? Um, what about dinner? What time does that, uh, is that hat at? Um, who cooks that meal? Uh, you know, who's there for that meal. All of those things are all conversations. There's uh, a bunch more that go into that. My wife and I constantly have these little um, moments of discovery, I guess, where um, there's expectations that she has. And um, I don't meet those, but they're over little things like, hey, these food items go here in the pantry. And here's why they go here, because I like them here. And I'm the one that uses them most. So you need to abide by that. And, and for me, it's, hey, this is my time to go and do this. And, and I need this private space. And um, I need you to help me out with that. And, 
you know, the list goes on. But um, those are the big things that changes when you go from singleness and living on your own, even in a dating relationship, you're till, still technically single, um, into a marriage relationship or covenant where you're living together. Um, it's understanding the expectations that you're carrying in that you may not realize, and also being willing to walk through communication processes where um, you have the other person communicate to you what their expectations are. And some of them you get to keep uh, because the other person will adjust to you. Other expectations, you have to change. You have to create your own new traditions. That was another big thing for us. Uh, Christy's family has a ton of traditions. One of their big ones is if there's a holiday or a birthday, we celebrate it on that day. My family grew up where if it's a birthday and it's on a Tuesday and that's not convenient for everyone else, we're going to celebrate on the closest Friday or Sunday or whenever everyone can get together. And we're flexible like that. Not a big deal. Um, my wife's family, not so much. You have a birthday on a Tuesday. We're all canceling plans. We're going to be there on Tuesday. And so that's an adjustment that we've had to walk through over the course of our four and a half, five years now. It's not something that we've even solved yet. Um, and and it's it's a lot of those things where it's like, okay, we need to set our own traditions for Christmas and Thanksgiving and those types of things. And they're going to be unique to our family that we just created. We'll take a little bit of your family, a little bit of my family. We'll mesh them together. Other things it's, Hey, I'll adjust to you and what your expectation is because it's not a big deal to me. And I love you. Um, and other times it's okay. I'll give up that expectation because, um, I'm going to adjust to you. So it's, it's a lot of that give and take thing. And that's not something that um, single people often foresee when they go into marriage because uh, it's not something that the dating world uh, brings up or, or highlights as an important thing. Um, fifth question, what effect did children have on your marriage? A big one. Um, we have two kids and our third child is on the way. Uh, so that's three in, uh, five years. And, um, so we're, we're adjusting and, and constantly figuring that out. Um, they've had a huge effect on our, on our marriage. Um, we, uh, we had a gentleman by the name of Cy Rogers here, um, a little while ago, and he speaks on, uh, sexuality and sexual identity and a lot of those great things. Um, so I gave this great analogy that stuck with my wife and I, and, uh, he talked about, um, just the ebbs and flows that your marriage takes as it goes throughout its process. Um, you get together and in that honeymoon stage where it's just the two of you and there's no kids, it's, you know, it's love and date nights and fun and excitement and, and sex whenever and however and whatever and all that stuff, which is great. Um, and then your first child comes and it's like, okay. Uh, we have to adjust and, and now you're more tired and I'm more tired and, and we're busy and, and managing things. And so it's, um, you know, it's a little bit different and it's okay. Well, if we get the baby down early enough, then maybe we can uh, find some time together tonight. And, um, you know, once the baby's old enough, we can have grandma, grandpa watch them and we'll have a date night. And uh, we just got to schedule some of that stuff. And then you have your second child and uh, things get even more hectic and, uh, you have to be even more intentional with the scheduling and more intentional with the time together uh, because it's really easy to fall into routine because that becomes a big part of your marriage now. It's the routine of here's when we wake up and this is when lunchtime is and this is when nap time is and this is when I get home from work and this is when you need help putting them down and giving them a bath and, and after all of that, do you have any energy for sex? Do you have any energy for a date night later this week? It's, it's a lot of that stuff. And, uh, you know, we're expecting our, our third child. And according to Cy Rogers, the thing that we can expect is, okay, I've got two o'clock open. How does that look for you? And, um, you know, you calendarize this stuff, but it's all seasons, you know, um, both of our children right now are, uh, three and under. And so we're going to have three kids under three, um, by September of this year. And, uh, this is a season. And, uh, soon, you know, within the next five years, they'll all be in school and that'll create a, a different season for us to enter into while they're in elementary school. And then they'll get into sports and middle school and a lot of that stuff. And a new season will begin and then high school and they'll start to experience some of their freedom and a new season will begin. And, um, it's understanding the long-term vision versus the short-term reality. And uh, our short-term reality right now is about to be three kids under three and schedules and routines and a lot of intentionality. 
the long-term vision is we're parents and we're in a committed marriage and a loving relationship. And it's worth putting in the effort and hard work right now to go in and um, it's worth putting in the effort and, and the hard work right now so that long-term we're investing in each other so that we can gather those fruits uh, of that harvest uh, right now. So um, that, that's the big thing. Like children make a huge impact on your marriage. Know that before you get into it. Um, also, this is a big thing that I try and communicate to people, especially young people looking towards marriage. Please think about whether or not children are a part of your long-term goals and plans, not only as individuals, but also as a family. Um, being in youth ministry, I see a lot of people that have children to kind of check a box. People that have children to save a marriage. People that have children because it's what everyone else is doing. It's cultural. It's an expectation that parents have. It's an expectation that friends have. It's an expectation that maybe you always grew up having and think, well, if I got rid of that expectation, what does that say about me? Am I insecure? Am I really right? And you go down this rabbit trail of questions. Well, let me encourage that for a second. Children are a really important responsibility and they're really, really special things. And it's not a box to check. And it's not a cultural stereotype to fit into. And it's not an expectation to meet of anyone else's. It's almost one of those things that you could use the word called um, to talk about. You know, are you called to be a parent? Because for a minimum of 18 years, minimum, okay, not all there is, but minimum of 18 years, hardcore investment is required of you. Sacrifices from work, sacrifices from dreams, sacrifices from goals in order to invest in this next person. And um, I'm meeting more and more people that are like, man, I don't know if I really want children. That's a big responsibility. And I tell them, listen, if you're not sure, don't do it. You know, don't, don't have a child and then discover halfway through that you're like, ugh, I don't know if I want to keep going at this. I don't know if I want to keep investing in this way. Man, this is really hard. And gosh, I wish I could just hit the cruise control button on it. There's no cruise control button on kids. And scientists, and, and, and they're doing studies and, and researchers, so I guess not scientists, but counselors and, and people in the psychological field are doing research, and they're finding correlations between um, divorce and age ranges of children as well as adults. And what they're finding is there's a period of time when a child hits um, puberty, when they hit 11, 12 years old right now. And mom and dad are hitting, uh, mom's about to hit menopause and dad's about to hit what they're calling, you know, menopause is kind of a joke, but men go through that midlife crisis thing. And they're finding correlation when those three things converge at the same time, it factors immensely into divorce and failed marriages. As a middle school pastor, I can't tell you how many times students have come up to me and said, my parents are talking about getting a divorce. Or parents coming up to me and saying, my marriage is on the rocks. We're really struggling. I don't think it's going to work. And all this stuff is happening. And it breaks my heart because I think sometimes it's like, man, maybe we lost sight of the long-term vision because of the short-term realities that are going on right now. Long-term, it's important to have a vision for your kids. Why am I having kids? Why do you want kids? You know, what's, what's the cause behind it? What's the motivating drive behind it? Um, I think we have to have at least some sort of a desire to be investing in another life, in another person to reproduce what God is doing in us. It's not enough to just say, well, I want kids because I think they're cute. I want kids because I've always wanted to hold a little baby. Well, guess what? They're that little baby for just a, a brief moment in time. And then they become a two-year-old. And good golly, two-year-olds are difficult. And they become a three-year-old. My daughter just turned three last Friday. She can't stop asking why. But why is her favorite phrase in the world. Asks it all the time. And then after three, she's going to become five and go into elementary school and then a teenager. And God help me when she becomes a teenager. But I have this vision for her that I would invest in her and pour into her and help cultivate who God has made her to be. That's the long-term vision. 
that I have to keep going back to in light of the short-term realities that, that are happening right now. So that's my little soapbox on, on children, I guess. So they change you a lot. They change your life a lot. They impact it a lot. They definitely have a huge impact on sex. And I know that's awkward to say, but somebody's got to say it, okay? You don't have sex as frequently after you have kids. Um, but you do it more intentionally, and it's still awesome. So there you go. I mean, hey, third kid's on the way. So what does that tell you? Um, all right, no more awkwardness. Number five, uh, sorry, number six, how did you deal with conflict? Or how do you deal with conflict in your marriage? Um, you deal with it quickly. You deal with it immediately. Um, and you understand the rules of engagement. Uh, please, please, please establish rules of engagement before you get married um, and agree on those and be disciplined and diligent to abide by those always. My wife and I do not ever um, in any context joke about splitting up divorce, separation, or anything like that. We don't joke about and we don't talk about um, you know, a lot of couples I've heard of, and this is their thing and, and whatever, this is just for me and my wife. We don't joke about, oh, if ever this famous person came to me and offered a night of sex or a date or whatever it was, you'd be allowed to take it. Um, we don't talk about that stuff because we don't find it fruitful or helpful for our marriage. Um, we talk and joke about a lot of things. We're, we're <laughs> you know, we're not prudish by any means, but um, divorce and separation is just not on the table. Um, because when you enter it into your marriage as even a joke, uh, you're giving it uh, a foothold. You're, you're planting a seed that in those moments of extreme bitterness and conflict and anger and rage and all the feelings that you will feel throughout your marriage, that's when that seed likes to sprout up as a plant. And it's an unhealthy one. And, and it's not even a plant, it's a weed. And, and it seeps into your marriage and it wraps its roots around your marriage and suffocates it in a very negative way. Um, so my wife and I have rules of engagement. Um, we deal with conflict immediately. And yes, there are some times where we've had conflict where we've had to walk away, uh, where we've had to cool off, where we've had to take time. Um, but that time is not long. It's not long term. It's not multiple days. Uh, we come back to each other. Um, we, we talk about it. There are times where we've gone to bed, um, angry, frustrated, mad at the other person, confused, hurt, all that stuff. Um, and the funny thing is at two in the morning, we're still awake. We're still lying next to each other and we both kind of roll over at the same time and we hash it out. Um, and, uh, it's important to remember that in conflict, um, that, the love that you have for the other person. And, and I'm not talking about the feelings that you have. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not using the word love interchangeably with feelings. The love that you have with the, for the other person, that, that tangible, sacrificial, I will give up myself for you love, as Jesus modeled it, that type of love um, has to prevail over everything uh, that you're talking about. Um, you have to stay calm. You can't get into personal attacks. Um, Christy and I have made it a point to study communication. It's been one of our biggest assets uh, within conflict. You need to better yourself at communication. You have to be great at communication in order to succeed at marriage. If you are not good at communication, you need to get good at it. Take whatever class Jessup offers. Um, Put yourself under whatever teacher there is that teaches communication or counseling skills or psychology class, whatever it is, do it. Um, every class that I took at Jessup um, that dealt with communication, counseling skills, um, psychology, processing, all that stuff are things that I've brought into my marriage. Uh, my wife and I have taken personality tests. We've adopted specialized language within our marriage um, that's specific to us and, and these personality tests that we use, that we go back to, that in moments of conflict, we say, hey, because I'm this personality, this is how I see this. This is why I'm interpreting it this way. And, and she'll come back to me and Chrissy will say, well, because of my personality, this is why I'm interpreting it this way. This is why I see it this way. And, and in that, and just understanding the personality differences, we're able to navigate some pretty difficult waters with one another. Um, but it starts with progressing our communication skills, never giving up on that. Um, understanding that, that counseling is not a negative thing. 
that uh, we've talked about going to counseling, even though there's really not a big issue or problem in our marriage, but because we find value in that. It's, it's helpful. It's successful. It bonds and unites people together. Um, we have a special language. And then we have, like I said, those, those boundaries and those guidelines, those parameters of how we engage one another in conflict. Um, we don't talk about divorce or separation. We don't re, um, result to name calling um, or personal attacks. When we explain hurts or frustrations, it's not, you did this and that's why I'm angry at you. It's, when this happened, this is how I felt. When this was said, this is what I thought of. And it's a lot less personal that way and a lot more helpful for the other person to kind of empathize. And that's the other big thing. We have to empathize with the other person, even when we don't want to, and and walk through those things together. I could go on and on and on about conflict. I won't, but those are some of the basics. Work on your communication. Understand that there are personality differences and find a good personality test to do with one another and allow that to create a special language for the two of you to use. Have guardrails and boundaries. Have rules of engagement. Make sure you create those things before you even get married um, because they will come up time and time and time again. Um, and if you think about it like, um, you know, like a, like a road trip that you're taking or, um, you know, going from point A to point B in a destination that you're trying to get to, if the destination is a long lasting marriage, um, then you're going to need a good map to get there and, and good boundaries and guardrails to, to stay on that path. Um, and so create those for yourself. Uh, so lastly, what advice would you give to your child about finding a mate? Um, don't look until you're 30 cause I have two girls. Um, don't date until after you're married. Um, let me choose the, the man so that it's an arranged marriage. Um, no, I, <laughs> that's hard. <laughs> I don't want to lose my little girls. Um, what advice would I give to my child? Um, a lot of what I've said already is advice that I'm going to give to my kid about relationships in general. I want to teach my girls how to succeed in relationships, not just how to look for a person. Um, I'll talk less about qualities in a person and more about what to do when you find a person whose qualities you admire or like. Um, it's not a one-off conversation. It's not a singular, hey, here's the advice, ready, set, go. Um, it's a continuous conversation that's going to be brought up all the time um, through opportunities. Uh, the advice that I'm going to give is hopefully going to be modeled in how I treat their mom, um, how I love on them and their mom at the same time, um, how I speak into their life, how their mom loves on me. Um, man, that modeling is going to be critical. That's probably going to be the biggest source of advice that I give to them is what I model and how I treat Christy and what she models and how she treats me and how we interact and respond to one another, how we're physically affectionate in front of our kids um, towards one another is a big deal. Uh, Cause I want them to know that I love their mom, that I believe that she's the most beautiful woman in the world. Uh, I find her sexy and attractive and um, worth ravishing and chasing after. And um, you know, being, uh, a little bit crude with, uh, because she drives me nuts in that way. I want them to see how I'm willing to walk through conflict with her, even when it's uncomfortable, um, that I'm willing to do it with love and patience and kindness and, and all of those things. Um, I want the advice that I give to be modeled first and spoken second, I guess. Um, so in finding a mate, I'm going to tell my girls, listen, you can choose whoever you want to, but realize that who you choose will often determine the amount of work that it will require to get to that end point that you want to get to. And if you want the work to be enjoyable, to be fun, um, to be something that you wake up every morning wanting to do, um, then choose wisely. Um, choose who you connect with wisely. Um, don't don't do it without intentionality. Think about it. Um, and then once you do choose that person, um, be intentional in how you go throughout that relationship. Uh, be intentional with how you love on that person. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so I think that's, that's the advice that I would give to my little girls about finding a mate. Uh, know that God, uh, God has a plan for them. He's, he's going to reveal that to them. He's going to guide them along the way. But ultimately, if you picture it like a triangle, the nearer that you draw him, uh, draw to him as an individual and the nearer that that person draws themselves to God as an individual, the closer the two of you are going to be as well. Um, so it's, it's a journey. What Christy and I talked about in our dating relationship is, you know, it's like running a marathon. Uh, I'm running that race that God is calling me to. And I'm running and I'm running and running and running. I'm going. And what I was always hoping for was to be running and then look to my right and see that someone was running the same direction at the same pace that I was. And when I look back on dating Christy and I look back on our marriage so far, that's what I've experienced. Uh, I'm running this race with, with full intentions of, of heading towards Christ. Of, of drawing near to him and I'm running and running, 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 running. And I look towards the right and there's Christy and, and she's running right next to me. And, uh, if she stumbles, I'm going to be there to pick her up and, and carry her on for that next mile. And if I stumble, I know that she's there to pick me up and, and carry me through that next mile. And, um, and now we're running and we have two little girls behind us soon to have a third child behind us. And, uh, what we're doing is discipling them and how to run the race. What we're showing them is what it means to pursue Christ first. And so uh, that's our goal. So thanks for the opportunity to uh, shoot you this video. Feel free to use it in class if you want to, or uh, if nothing else, hopefully it, it helps Olivia know that it was me dropping the ball, not her. So um, thanks so much. Uh, have a wonderful day um, and uh, God bless.